This is what the skies look like outside my house. I live in Khan Gyan. It's a city in the heart of northeast Thailand. It's a city with a few hundred thousand people, but it's certainly not the sprawling metropolis of Beijing or Jakarta. So what's going on here? Every year over the months of January, February, and March, the air in Thailand and much of Southeast Asia becomes choked with pollution. A smoky haze hangs in the air, making it hard to breathe. It's caused by something called PM 2.5. But what is PM 2.5, and how do we measure it? Why is it bad for our health? What's the cause, and what can we do about it? In this video, I'm going to answer all of those questions, and in doing so, we'll also see how your dessert may be the reason why Thailand is choking in air pollution. So come along with me as we understand PM 2.5 and find the bitter taste hiding in your sweet treat. The first thing we have to understand is what we're talking about when we say PM 2.5. PM 2.5 is short for particulate matter that is smaller than 2.5 microns. That's about 30 times smaller than the width of a human hair. It's even smaller than the size of a red blood cell. These tiny particles can sometimes be called aerosols. PM 2.5 is not like other forms of air pollution, such as ozone or carbon monoxide, which are specific chemical compounds. PM 2.5 is a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets found in the air. Some particles, such as dust, dirt, soot, and smoke, are large or dark enough to be seen with the naked eye. But other components of PM 2.5 are so small they can only be seen with an electron microscope. PM 2.5 particles can be a wide range of sizes and shapes, and they can be made up of hundreds of different chemicals. So we need a way to group them. One way to categorize aerosols is as either primary or secondary, depending on their source and how they form. Primary aerosols are emitted directly in particulate form. When incomplete combustion occurs, such as in a smoldering fire or in an inefficient engine, or when dust is kicked up, tiny particles are sent into the air. If these particles are smaller than 2.5 microns, they are PM 2.5. Major sources of primary aerosols include vehicle exhaust and biomass burning, as well as dust from construction sites, unpaved roads, or even desert winds. Secondary aerosols, on the other hand, are formed as a result of chemical processes that can sometimes be really complex. But basically, volatile chemicals such as sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides interact with things like hydroxyl radicals and sunlight, which leads to the creation of tiny particles. These sulfur and nitrogen oxides are pollutants emitted from automobiles, power plants, and industries. So PM 2.5 can come from a lot of different sources, even natural ones like volcanoes. And depending on the source, atmospheric chemistry, and meteorological conditions, the composition of PM 2.5 can vary widely. But what's really interesting is that if you analyze the chemical composition of PM 2.5, you can actually get a good picture of where those particles came from. It's a bit like forensic evidence at a crime scene. Let's look at one study from Hong Kong that analyzed the components of PM 2.5 and how that changed over the year. What they found is that sulfate, an organic carbon, made up a large proportion of the PM 2.5 mass in Hong Kong. And from that information, they were able to estimate the source of where these particles originated. A big portion of their PM 2.5 came as a result of secondary formation processes. These are those secondary aerosols, those sulfates and nitrates that react in the air to form secondary particles. But they also found substantial contributions from primary sources of biomass burning and crustal dust, which is just a fancy word for dirt. And so the composition of PM 2.5 will tell you its source. And while the composition of PM 2.5 is different everywhere, the most common sources of PM 2.5 are secondary formation from sulfate and nitrates, biomass burning, dust from the ground, and vehicle exhaust.
And so now that we know what PM2.5 is and where it comes from, we have to ask, what does PM2.5 do to your health? Because PM2.5 is so small, it's able to penetrate deep into the lungs and deposit onto the lungs alveoli. It can even directly enter the circulatory system by passing through the gas blood barrier. Because of this, the effects of PM2.5 are wide ranging. Exposure to elevated PM2.5 concentrations has been associated with increases in respiratory infections, cardiovascular disease, as well as neurological disorders and premature births. Globally, it is estimated that air pollution is the fourth leading risk factor for disability and death, what we call burden of disease among men. Among women, it ranks even higher as the number three risk factor. There are actually a few different ways to measure PM2.5. A good place to start is satellites. Sensors on satellites can remotely detect PM2.5. For example, here are satellite estimates of PM2.5 concentrations for the year 2015. You can see how India, China, Bangladesh, and Thailand have some of the worst air quality in Asia. However, satellites cannot provide real-time data and localized estimates. For that, we need air quality monitoring stations. These monitoring stations can actually use pretty sophisticated methods to measure the microscopic particles. And they can tell us the amount of PM2.5 within a volume of air. The units for PM2.5 are micrograms per cubic meter. A cubic meter is, well, a cube with all dimensions of one meter. For reference, the inside of a Toyota Camry has about 2.5 to 3 cubic meters of air. Naturally, most air in the environment won't have more than around 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5, but really polluted air can have 200 micrograms per cubic meter or more. Because this isn't always intuitive, air quality is often reported using an air quality index, or AQI. Basically, an AQI uses a formula to convert the air pollution concentration into a score or an index value. That score will often have an associated color indicating the health risk level. The most commonly used AQI is the one from the US EPA. In the EPA's AQI, there are six color-coded categories of index values derived from PM2.5 concentrations, from green, good, to maroon, hazardous. What's important to know about this system, though, is that it is based on the 24-hour average PM2.5 concentration. This is important from a human health risk standpoint, but it is often not helpful for making day-to-day -day decisions for the public. For example, if the PM2.5 concentration quickly changes from one hour to the next, which happens a lot, the 24-hour average will take time to reflect that change. In that case, the 24-hour AQI doesn't accurately reflect real-time conditions. You can see an example of this here in Kwangan. At 9 p.m., the PM2.5 concentration increased to more than 50 micrograms per cubic meter, which is pretty high. But the AQI from the 24-hour average was only half, 26, which was reported as good. The AQI is a helpful tool for the public, but in this case, it would actually mislead someone into thinking the air quality was good, when in fact, it was not. There is a solution to this, though. It's called Nowcasting AQI. The AQI website, aqicn.org, uses a so-called Nowcast AQI that gives you the air quality index based on current air pollution levels. And in fact, when I look at the AQI on this website, I see it reported as unhealthy rather than good. So if you're looking at the AQI, the first thing you need to know is whether that AQI was based on the 24-hour average or is a Nowcast of current conditions. If you're not sure, the AQICN website is always a good place to start. So what kind of AQIs do we see in Thailand? As you can see in January 2020, the AQI was over 150 nearly everywhere in Thailand, colored red for unhealthy. This is fairly common in the winter. So what is driving air quality problems in Thailand? And what does all of this have to do with cake? According to estimates from Thailand's Pollution Control Department, here are the top sources of PM2.5 in Thailand. Number four, electricity generation, which accounts for about 11% of the national PM2.5 mass. Number three, transportation, which, which accounts for 13% nationally. Number two is manufacturing, which accounts for 17%. And finally, open burning, which contributes 54% of the PM2.5 mass in Thailand. That was nationally. When focused only on Bangkok, a more detailed analysis came to the same conclusion. During the dry season, when PM2.5 levels are highest, 
the leading source of PM2.5 was biomass burning at 38%, followed second by diesel vehicles at 27%. Another really interesting analysis used machine learning to see what factors were most associated with high PM2.5 levels, again in Bangkok. And again, burning was undeniably the leading cause of air pollution in the capital. The PM2.5 level was closely associated with the number of fires identified by satellites. In fact, considering the factors associated with PM2.5, fires from as far away as 720 kilometers were more associated with high PM2.5 than traffic or calm winds. So what is being burned? Well, a lot of things. Rice, stubble, forests, trash. But what is really critical to the PM2.5 problems in the winter months is sugarcane. Thailand is the fourth largest sugar producer and second largest exporter in the world for sugarcane. More than 380,000 farmers and 4.5 million acres of land are dedicated to sugarcane farming in Thailand. If we look at the land that has been cultivated with sugarcane, shown in green, and compare that to satellite estimates of land burned, we see that most of sugarcane land is burned. In the 2018-2019 harvest season, approximately half of all sugarcane brought to the factory was burned. If you've never seen sugarcane up close, it's a stalk with a lot of rough leaves. When harvesting, all that is desired is the stalk, where the cane juice is. Burning a sugarcane field is a quick and low-cost way to remove the leaves, leaving only the charred sugarcane stalk making it easier to cut and transport to factories. It's a way to save on labor costs. No one wants to burn sugarcane, farmers say, but it's the only option we have sometimes. In response to the annual air quality problems, in June 2019, the Thai government issued regulations in an attempt to reduce sugarcane burning within a three-year timeline. However, once the public had forgotten about PM2.5, the government backtracked on the regulations in November, raising the limit from 20% up to 50%, which is essentially what is done in a normal year. Nevertheless, the regulations miss the point. The long-held practice of burning sugarcane persists because Thai farmers struggle with high production costs and fluctuating year-to-year -year income amid declining global sugar prices. Ultimately, the need to pay the bills forces Thai farmers to turn to burning. These regulations ignore the fact that harvesting fresh sugarcane costs around three times as much as burning it. Farmers understand that burning is harmful, but ultimately farmers have to calculate which method, burned or fresh, maximizes profit. And the answer to this equation is clear for most. Continue burning sugarcane. One farmer explained, the labor cost is high and we don't have the machinery to cut the sugarcane. It's expensive. <laughs> PM2.5 in Thailand, like all PM2.5, comes from many sources. And as such, reducing it requires many different approaches, with each targeting a different area. Policies like encouraging mass transport, improving emissions standards, and street cleaning will have some positive impact and should not be abandoned. However, because biomass burning is the number one source of PM2.5, and pre-harvest burning of sugarcane is a leading contributor to biomass burning, the priority should be to address pre-harvest sugarcane burning. Two possible actions include financial assistance to farmers to support the more expensive harvesting methods and providing better access to machinery. But until that's done, keep your PM 2.5 mask handy. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and be sure to check out some other videos on my channel, which is all things public health.